not sure. But thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Katerina Vavskaya, and I paint and teach. So this has been a topic of my interest for a while. And I just put my name up there. So you feel free to Google me. My whole life's on there. And Vida, are you able to add people, admit them? Because I'm still clicking to admit people. Yes, I will be doing that. So don't, don't worry. Okay, great, great. Okay. So how this whole thing started is I took a class at the Art Students League in New York with um, a really amazing painter, Alan Feltis, and it was supposed to be um, collage and composition in painting. We never got to the collage. He just kept talking and it was fascinating because he talked about shapes that go together in painting and I would walk and the class would be like four hours long or something. I would walk down to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I said, okay, I'm gonna find something that doesn't match his rules. And I found this painting, the cow painting at the Met. It might not be the same one, but it's close. And I was like, well, there's nothing in this painting that follows anything. It's just a cow and a cloud. And then I look at it and the cow, the cow shape actually matches the cloud formation exactly. If you flip it upside down, it's called mirroring shapes. And that's when it clicked that every single painting that makes sense is actually really coherently put together. And I've been thinking about it for a while, either it's learned or it's intuitive or it's a little bit of both. So this is a Dutch painter, young herdsman with cows. And then we talked about this painting a lot. This is Balthus. He, this was from the 1930s. He was a really superb painter and I saw an exhibition of his at the Met probably. It was amazing, but you see how this, can you guys see my pointer? I hope you can. This is uh, the circle head rests exactly in this almost square shape. So it leads your eye back all the way back down the street so he flattens the space and then extends it and obviously the use of red because triangles are the best shapes they're the most stable and the most foundational so we have red red and red which creates a triangle and connects your gaze from the foreground to the background and her um vest coat thing is in the, the exact shape of this window. And everything like this, I strongly believe is on purpose because once you see it, you can't really unsee it. And there's all these angles here and the red ball also because you want your eye to go around in a circle. And there it is, the circle. And the ball completes the circle, you go here, then to the hat, then to the rectangle, then to the girl, then back to the ball and the ball in itself is a circle. So this, he's a really weird painter and really good to look at for painting. Those of us who, if any of you are interested in. So this, I put this in because this is Balthus, this is Piero della Francesca. And you can tell from the painting by Balthus that he definitely looked up to this painter. Just the way he flattened the figures. And I think there's actually an image somewhere, I didn't find it, of Balthus's copy of this exact, this is not actually a painting painting, it's a fresco in the chapel in Arezzo. So Piero della Francesca is one of my favorite painters because he was a mathematician. I also like math, but in the 1400s was really, really popular painter of his day and he painted frescoes, but not so many because he was also really advanced in math and he spent a lot of time doing math. And then he was completely forgotten when he died. And you know that paintings and painters go in and out of fashion. And everybody, when I was in school, everybody loved this painter. And I couldn't understand why, because 
it was just faded pictures in a book. And when I got to see them in person, it really stands up. So you can see here how he places the heads in the circles and everything is a circular formation here to form a triangle. Then this actually, look, this shape exactly, this triangle is the same exact triangular shape as the top of the building. So he strived to make his paintings very balanced also in shallow space. Um, but at the same time, they're my favorites because they're also filled with humanity, like feeling, which I think about a lot. Okay, so this is from a cycle of frescoes called The Legend of the True Cross in Arezzo. Oh, I have to click on it, I think. This one is in a different place, San Sepulcro, where he was born. It's a really sleepy town in Italy. And I actually got to see this fresco up close because they were restoring it. And there were these scaffolds. So I climbed, <laughs> I don't remember how it was, but it, it was so that I was level with this painting and like laying on the floor trying to get a peek at it. And then they finally kicked me out. But anyway, there is this thing called um, the Piero della Francesca Trail where all these enthusiasts go to Italy to see all the paintings that he made. He didn't make that many paintings. And you can literally get off the train in Arezzo, see the chapel, get back on the train, go to San Sepulcro, see this painting. And basically, maybe not in the same day, but pretty close. And this is, um, again, really shallow space filling the forms and the triangle, obviously. Here's the triangle, red, red, and red. And everything is on purpose. Oh, I have a gift to give. Okay, so these are just put in shots from the chapel in Arezzo. And it used to be so popular, this cycle of frescoes that it was packed and you can't get in. Now the popularity has faded so you can you can get there. When I was there, I actually we were like the only person the only people in the little room and it was the most amazing experience of my life. And this is 1460 in Arezzo, Italy. Let's see what else. And obviously, I don't think they can get really good pictures because I think it's fading. Here's Katerina, quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, one sec. The question was, why is the triangle and the circle important? The triangle, because it's the most stable and foundational shape it's balanced, but it's active because it has diagonals on it. So it makes it an active shape. The rectangle or the rectangle is longer and slightly unbalanced. That's why we paint on rectangular surfaces because we have the room to balance them with the imagery in the painting. It's really difficult to paint in a square. On a square surface you can, but the square is already in perfect balance. So it's harder to make a really balanced painting in a square, but the square, everything is parallel, so it's completely flat, but the triangle adds action and stability to the painting. And the circle just makes your eye move around the surface. The whole idea is for every single painter ever on earth, I think, is to keep the viewer's eye in the painting. So how do you keep the viewer's eye in the painting? It has to go around in a circle and it doesn't really want to drop off to the next thing. I keep losing my pointer, you guys. So sorry about that. This is, this reminds me of Uccello, which I'll show you next. These are all scenes from the legend of the true cross. And if you guys have ever seen the movie, The English Patient with Juliette Binoche, when she's swinging in with the hot guy in the room, those are the paintings in the movie. I'm sure they're remakes. They're not 
actual, I don't know if they would let her swing in, in actual frescoes. I think the room is too small anyway. And I thought it was really interesting how these paintings were forgotten for hundreds of years. Maybe not these particular ones, but some of his other works definitely got also painted over and they had to like uncover the walls. And in the movie, they were hiding and forgotten in that space. So this, look at the horses here and all the people piled in. And then this is by Uccello, Paolo Uccello. He makes really nice drawings. Also same time period, 1440. And this is egg tempera, so it's not fresco, it's egg tempera with walnut oil and linseed oil. But look, look how similar the horses are. And if you want, and look at all the diagonals leading up in space. And then the diagonal of the landscape in the back, because remember landscapes weren't considered the real deal until recently, they were just like filler for um, larger scenes like this. So everyone is looking the same way, usually coherency of the group, and then somebody else is looking the opposite way. So if you look, every single person <laughs> with this red mushroom guy, reminds me of like Mario Brothers, <laughs> goes over, but these are looking that way and the horse and it doesn't even have to have to be a person it can be like a dog so cello so nice i don't know oh it's the national gallery in london this is piero della francesca i this is the painting that i think about a lot because it's in um semicircle here and then the rectangle. So if you have a circle, either architecturally or in the painting itself, you have to complete it in the painting. So if we come, our eyes come down, the heads of the people, actually, I think it comes down even lower. You follow the trees, then this guy who is bending to the left, just to keep your eye in the painting. He doesn't want to bend the other way because that will make you, your eyes leave the picture. And the most important part is to keep the eyes in the picture. Then we follow this belt thing, Christ's uh, cloth, up the arms, it's exact, look. And if we come down here, following the arms of the angels and the hands, it makes a perfect circle with the outer edge of the painting on top. I think it's amazing. I mean, it's clearly, clearly on purpose. And then if there's a square or almost square rectangle at the bottom, it has to be completed at the top, which is completed with clouds and the bird dove. There it is. And then I'm, I'm sure there's other stuff in here. And of course, there's always, there are always circular things on the top of the head, just to show us the form of the head. It's really good. This is, uh, and the belly, actually, this is good to know, because the belly button is almost always in the center of the painting. People do this a lot. The belly button is really important for some reason. And obviously this line in the center, splitting it in half is really important. Yeah. I actually, I don't know where this painting is. I can't remember. So the next person is Picasso. This is one of my favorite paintings. I love it so much. Uh, it's uh, my favorite period. I well, no, I like all of Picasso, but this in particular is at the National Gallery. You can go see it. And it's amazing. I sat in front of it for like four hours once while waiting for somebody. It's good to wait for people in the museum. At least you have something to do. I, of course, for sure, I think he knew Piero della Francesca. Not knew, knew because they're in the different time periods, but was aware of. 
And I think what's really interesting about this painting by Picasso is just basically a colored in drawing. And he gives you this sense of movement of figures moving across the landscape, even though there's nothing happening really in the landscape. So another rule of composition I feel is bunch of people, someone off to the side. Why? Because if you cover up the lady in the foreground, the whole painting disappears completely. Your eye just stays here and doesn't move around. But after staring at this for a while, the, so the woman serves as an anchor in the painting to the group. Everything is diagonal here, warm to cool. So warm colors always come forward, cool colors recede. So cool is like blue, red is warm for sake of brevity. And I figured out after staring at this for a while, how he got us for us to have a sense of movement across the landscape. And I think it's the repetition of negative shapes so if you think of the painting's edge as also a completion of a shape, like here's the first negative shape, then we have between his feet negative shape, then between here and here. And so this rhythm, they're not exactly the same, but there's fat, thin, fat, thin, fatter shape, thinner shape, fatter shape, and then fatter shape. This is what gives our brain the idea that there's movement. And again, everyone is looking the same way, except for one person. And it's the guy in the red. And just to accentuate that idea, his little hat is pointing that way also. I mean, it, it couldn't have pointed the other way because it would have broken up the rhythm of the painting. And again, I really, I don't, I don't know, I really gravitate towards paintings that have really shallow space, meaning not much there, but they really extend that space. There, this is shallow space. All we get is a foreground with a bunch of people standing there, really nothing in the background and some clouds or whatever. But to help us feel more space in the painting, he puts the guy's hand right here. So we have to go over the hand and then we get to the scarf and the back and all that. And look, they're all, I think in order for figures to feel anchored in the painting, they either have to be with somebody else, they're all in a group or they attach themselves to an object. And look, they all have objects except for this. I mean, I think, yeah, that might be the scarf in his hand. Everybody else has some sort of accessory. And another thing that is really important sometimes, and if we get to it, there's another, there's a painting by Degas that did this also. The leg is missing. The guy's red leg is missing because it doesn't need to be there. Painting is not real life. The girl's leg stands in. It's a placed exactly so it serves for both. If the other guy's leg was in there also, it would have been too much information and it would have just broken up the rhythm in the painting. And they're all turning slightly differently. So that, and look, oh, I just saw this actually. They are standing in a circle. We go from here to here facing and it's also how their bodies are. They're not flat or parallel or profile. It's just slightly turned. This guy to this guy to this guy, then down. And then down the girl's arm to the bouquet and then back up again. That's really good. That's so good. And then all the spaces to the edge are considered. I think this woman is so beautiful. And look at her hat. And look at the basket. It's the same thing upside down. Why do they do that? Because it connects, it makes the painting as if it's woven in space, like a fabric, not things on top of each other, but it, 
it connects the painting together because he definitely needs the group to connect visually to the woman. Oh, it's amazing. It's so good. And then there's other weird things. I lost my pointer again. This, she's barefoot. One foot is barefoot and then she's wearing a slipper, some kind of red slipper. Yeah, so the, all of these things together give you a sense of movement, figures moving across the landscape. And another thing that Picasso did a lot, maybe not in this painting, but other ones, like every hand is painted differently. Nothing is ever too much the same, but there's a similar shape. And I'm sure we can keep looking at this one and find more stuff, but okay. This is another one of my favorite paintings. I mean, these are all my favorite paintings. This, was, this uh, slideshow could be called Katerina's favorite paintings. <laughs> this is Puvi de Chavant, Christian inspiration. There is a, I don't remember where this painting is, but there's a whole hallway of his paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's the hallway leading to the special exhibitions room. So if you have ever been to a special exhibition at the Met, you've walked by his paintings and there are these fresco-like landscapes of people doing weird things in the landscape. And I've also heard, I don't know, this is all rumors. He mixed a specific yellow, Indian yellow into the color of his paints, just so he could get this homogenous feel. Indian yellow used to be made from urine of cows fed on mango leaves. That's why they call it Indian yellow. For additional pay. So this, this is, does a similar thing where in the Picasso's painting, everyone's attached to an object or floor, whatever. Here, each figure or group of figures signify spaces they occupy. So this guy in the foreground, obviously he's holding some thing and the desk table thing is diagonal going into space because if it was just horizontal, it would flatten the painting. But if we are looking at him, he's saying, if you're looking at me, you're in the foreground, in the foreground of the painting. This section is the middle ground. So are these guys. And so each person is attached to physical objects. I especially like this painting because it uh, uh, mm, solves the idea of inside space versus outside space. So both spaces in one painting. And I even think that the hand, I lost my pointer again. I lost my, oh, there it is. The hand on the wall is space. He's saying, you're outside in the light, but if you follow my arm, it will lead you inside to the rest, to the painting and to this guy. And if everything is cropped at the edges, like we can't see, I think it's a painter. We can't see what he's actually painting. And then whatever they're looking at, we, we can barely see it. Then again, everybody's looking the same way, except look at this creepy woman on the edge. <laughs> except this guy completely in gold, holding up a candle to an image. Anyway, what I was saying, if, they, if there are shapes that are cropped at either edge, that gives the painting a sense of something happening outside the picture plane that we cannot see, the mystery. If you want a clear, coherent, straightforward painting, then you can just have nothing cropped off at the edge. And again, the figures here are in the sort of triangle actually. And to enhance the triangle, we have the floor diagonals. So every little thing is always used to extend space. Why? Because it's flat. The painting is a flat object. It's just really flat. So the design of the picture has to give us some space because we as humans exist 
in a world that has space. So in order for us to observe and breathe in the painting, there has to be space in the painting. It doesn't have to be realistic or physically defined space. It can be abstract space, but it's still space. And then all the windows and arches, three arches, two of, you know, view of the landscape, and then these angels, blue here so of course there has to be blue here it's a similar blue and then i think i even counted the trees like one two three trees three angels and i was last time i looked at this i was actually thinking why this one is down on the ground and making this l shape or corner shape because if you look at the inside this wall to the floor is making the same exact shape as this angel. So that makes sense, that's good. And of course the scale, scale is really important because if someone is closer to us, they're larger. And then the bunch of people in the back, the smaller ones. Yeah, it's good. Because if you take the objects away from the people, they would just be floating. There are barely any shadows, really. I know what's going to happen. OK, now who's next in this? OK, this is a good one. This is Bellini at the Frick. And there is a, a really interesting art historian Elkins, I think his name is. He taught at the art, I think he still teaches at the Art Institute of Chicago. He has an entire article on this painting, which is superb. So if you're interested in this painting, you can just Google James Elkins Bellini and he'll explain in further detail what I'm about to gloss over. But the same thing, the pose of St. Francis matches the mountain shape behind him exactly. It's the same exact curve. Why? To attach him to the space, to attach whatever we're looking at here to the actual space behind him. And if you look at his rope belt and the folds in the clothing, they match the trellis exactly and the fissures in the stone. And of course, he's witnessing a miracle, but we can't see the miracle. It's outside the picture plane. So the further mystery to the painting. And then, of course, the skull, his book, his slippers. So the pose of the people, of any person in the painting, always mimics the surroundings. And there is sky serves as a window in the painting. If this was a wall or something else, the thing would immediately flatten because there's so much information here. And of course, we enter all space on a diagonal. Here's the diagonal following the stones and then this thing, some kind of donkey. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a recognizable shape. It just has to so serve its purpose. This, okay, so I have been to the barns a lot because I actually taught a class analyzing the paintings at the barns and talking about the barns method. So I incorporated some of that into this uh, presentation. This is Sarah, the models. And of course there's a triangle. Why wouldn't there be? But the most interesting thing, even knowing these rules, it doesn't distract from looking at the paintings. In fact, it enhances your experience with the paintings. I think I lost my pointer again. Where is it? There it is. There is the triangle. Everybody is facing a different direction now. This is the famous painting, his other famous painting, um, Le Grand Jot, when they're on an island. And remember that every, every painter who painted during this time period, what's the time, 1886, 1888, it has to be, look how good I am, look how well I can paint, commission my paintings, put me in a show. The exact 
narrative of this painting is unknown, I feel. It's just a really classical theme, but modernized. And it has to do with society depicted here versus private space, and then exterior landscape versus room. And of course, there's a circle going around. And she, the, maid, the model standing is standing on a little circular thingy. It's interesting to look at it in the, to look at the paintings this way because the rug or whatever she was standing on didn't have to be a circle, could have been a rectangle. And then there's definitely a passage of red, like passage of color through a, a landscape or painting, blue. I don't know. And then these rectangles, look at the rectangles. I think these paintings in the back also mimic the shape of the models. So a tall, longer one in the middle, shorter, wider shape, not as people, but as shapes to the right, and then a longer broken up shape to the left. Then if you've ever been to the barns, right below this painting is, hold on a minute, I have to click. This is Cezanne, card players. And barns also had a really specific reason, I'll show you. So this one's on top, this one's at the bottom because this painting is more light and airy. And if you walk around the barns, the paintings are arranged in such a way to give you an idea of the skyline inside the building and then earth at the bottom. So this painting has more earth tones, the Cezanne, than the Seurat. And that's why I think he placed them that way. So this is card players, of course, there's a table there with a knob because the knob extends the space even more. Again, really flat space, but he shoves all these people in and they're sitting in a circle and their hands are in a circle also. It's just a repetition of shapes. And it has four pipes on the wall, same number of people, four people, four pipes. So the pipes are mimicking the positions of the people. And usually you want an odd number of people because your brain actually, or objects, your brain actually counts one, two, one, two. So it's always looking for the pair. So if it goes one, two, one, it's gonna keep looking for the two and keep moving around the page, the eyes. But if you have an even number of objects or people, it'll just stop. It'll be like, okay, I'm done. And then this, uh, whatever thing, painting, I can't really see this, something's blocking it, but it's, it's holding your eye in the painting. If it was an empty space, your eyes would leave. But the whole point is to not let your eyes leave the painting. Cezanne was really adamant and I feel aggressive in his compositions. So he never gave you a way out. Matisse did, Matisse always had a blank, sort of space at the bottom to let you out. So that's why his paintings have more of a, I feel less heavy mood. And everyone's sort of in their own isolation there, but together, separate, but together. Oh, I think I have, we are not gonna get to the end of the slideshow. I put in extra slides, so where however far we get is fine this is caravaggio he was crazy and he i think killed somebody and then ran away and they chased him through rome but this painting is amazing it's in a it's in the chapel of san maria del popolo in rome and conversion of saint paul if you ever have been or will go to Italy, it's really nice because all you have to do is walk into a church, see a few paintings and walk back out. It's not overwhelming like a museum. I think now you have to put coins in for the lights to go on. So everybody just stands in front of the painting in the dark waiting for somebody to put the coins in. But I put in this painting again, one, because it's really shallow space a whole, a whole horse is shoved in to a vertical painting 
and we have the figure at the bottom with the arms up completing the circle so if we like start at the spot on the horse's bum go down the leg down the arms to the foreground red in the foreground because red comes forward and cool colors recede and then up look the horse's stripe on the nose matches exactly it gives us a pathway to the ears up the neck and then we have this head here and all the way around this painting is magnificent because especially when in comparison to other paintings at the church um all the people who were commissioned to make paintings for those chapels were like really good amazing painters of their day and in comparison to caravaggio they paled it just looked like wallpaper because nothing compares to him in person and it's very revolutionary use of light and dark and size relationships cropping definitely somebody else would have left some space you know some more space some more breathing room okay so this one is also at the barns this is the riffian by matisse i put it in because yellow ochre slippers bring your eyes to the foreground and the next painting is Cezanne's the farmer yellow ochre slippers bring your eye to the foreground and he wanted to make a painting that's monumental so that's why the vertical um huge figure filling up the space vertically and nothing really else there and this was a revolutionary approach because you were supposed to depict farmers working hard in the field you weren't supposed to paint portraits of them as people so the matisse one is 1912 just for a timeline and i actually don't remember which one which this is earlier 1800s i think Wait, let me go back again really monumental shape hardy guy sitting on a rectangular box and the thing about matisse which is amazing he just uses a really loose color and creates space with color because he was born in a town where there was a textile dying factory and that sort of color obsessed him for the rest of his life i think it's amazing and then how this thing the, the head is touching the top and then the foot is touching the bottom all to give you a sense that he like the painting is barely large enough for him to sit in and as if he's about to stand up and run away okay should i i should do a few more so then we have this yellow ochre door frame at a slight diagonal because whenever there is a vertical it flattens space and of course his feet are in the triangle we need those triangles look at the triangle that his feet make and then the triangle of the shirt same and then we have the all upside down triangle here all of these shapes in the painting make it coherent and make it i don't know like pleasing for the brain to look at our brains like harmony repetitive shapes and a way directions to look at the painting so we're just going up and then coming back down and then of course there's cooler colors in the back warmer colors in the front and warmer colors on the floor but he uses this red stripe and yellow stripe to connect the background to the foreground and the person just this yellow ochre on the door connects us to the figure in the painting because it can't be separate it has to be together and oh this i put this in because it's so weird this is doesn't even have a face it's a knob <laughs> this is Cezanne at the barns and this is a really popular theme of bathers nude bathers except there is no water where are they bathing 
it looks like it's really cold and gloomy and there is the shards of branches cutting in with no leaves. So it must not be summer, except they have no clothes on. And if, it's just a weird, weird painting. And if you, you this, I, I read somewhere that there was actually a face here, but then he erased it towards the end. This flowing fabric down to the corner, all of the fruit lined up. Of, okay, this is good. The knee is up just to have your eye go around and not get stuck there and this cloth thing. And you can't even really tell. I mean, you can tell a little bit male or female, but you can't really and all the, and the clouds are really aggressive and the foliage and stuff. So should I stop here for questions or do a few more? Let's see, um, how do folks feel about that? Would we like to see a couple more? Or are there uh, general questions? I'd like to I'd see like more. To, yeah, same here. Okay, so should I just go till like 725 then? Sure. Okay, good. So, Cezanne. This is Renoir. I know Renoir gets a lot of flack and it's actually really popular among painters or whomever to hate Renoir for whatever reason, but he was really superb at composition. He was striving towards perfect balance and I was really wondering why he was so loved and admired during his lifetime and every single painter that changed the course of painting after him always looked up to him. And I think I got my answer after pondering it for a while is the composition is superb. And if you were ever to look at these pictures in black and white as they could have been looked at earlier because nobody had color reproductions, the cropping is so contemporary. And some of his other paintings, especially, it could look like it was just taken by a film camera. Because remember at this point, they had cameras and they didn't need to depict ultra realistic spaces or people as before, the, um, before photography. And this is his family, his wife, his son. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in a circle <laughs> like the bonnet if there is a really obnoxious bonnet that his wife is wearing of course there is the bonnet for the baby just to connect your gaze back and forth and the hat here has a circular thing to accentuate its form they're all looking you know, she's looking towards her. He's looking that way also. She's hiding this round, of course, it's round ball behind her back. Maybe they're playing some sort of game. And it's sort of, I think he wanted an atmosphere of family, familiarity, lightheartedness, light. And this is the largest portrait in his career. This is actually um, 1896. And of course it was, everyone's dressed up. I mean, it was popular for boys to dress up in sort of sailor uniforms at that time for a well-to-do family. And at this time he was making some money off of his paintings. And again, he wanted to show off, look how nice my family is. Look how I'm making money from my paintings. And of course there's a group and someone off to the side, I think. You, it can go either way, three people here in a group and then two people off to the side or the other way. And if, uh, balance, obviously. And then even like the roundness here of the belt thing and then to the hat. And then of course our eye just goes around and around and really shapes of white together, shapes of dark together and then red I think it's really weird and really nice. And if you look at this shape that the figures make, the negative space, the branch thing is making the same exact shape. 
it's re it's repeating the shape and then here's a vertical for the wall and a vertical for the tree the tree had to be there it had no other option because it had to mirror the vertical of the wall it's so good and remember our eye can't go off the page so that's why this dark shape is there he could have like she didn't have to he didn't have to put in the clothes like he did, but he did it every single stroke, every single thing is for a formal reason in the painting. Super stable, happy family that is out for a walk. And of course the narrative component. But yeah, I think that's really interesting that that dark triangular thing is there. Oh, and the, oh, I put this in to show you that again, that the Renoir is at the bottom because it has more earth tone colors like the red brown even the darks are earth tones and the greens are more earthy so it's towards the bottom where land would be our imaginary horizon line and then the Cezanne cool blue cloud trees and even the bodies are all cool cooler bluer anyway so that's why Cezanne is at the top Let's see what else is there. Oh yeah, this is so good. It's so, you see, if you have the shapes really set up, the inside can just be fluff. I just put this in because we looked at the Cezanne. The, everybody painted bathers. It's like they had a party painting bathers. And then I actually, I think I saw an exhibition somewhere like Picasso's bathers, Renoir's bathers, Cezanne's bathers all together. And of course they're in a circle. There's somebody at the foreground. Then look at how her arm is going up. And um, towards the edge, like her elbow, and then up the tree trunk to this person. And all the bushes are always fluffy, just like the figures. And they mimic the shapes of the people in front of them. Look. This is a circle and it's so similar to this person. This is a bush and its edge is really similar to the shape this woman is making. And then we have an opening right here for the sky, just like the, and in this opening, we have more people in a triangular formation. <laughs> then, then we go to the bushes here and there's somebody standing here. She had to be standing. She had no other option because she had to balance out the tree on this side. You see, he makes similar tricks throughout the paintings, but each time it's done so differently that everybody of course uses the same rules and it never gets old. And then the bushes are split in half right here as if they, oh, this tree actually aligns with where they're holding their arms and hands, look. So the figures are split just as the bushes are split. And of course, something in this corner just to get you back in there so you don't leave. Oh, it's so, and it, it is quite difficult to make form with such fuzzy strokes. Oh, good. We'll we'll do this one. The, I only put this painting in because it's also Renoir, but it's a different period, so it's a bit sharper. In you know, with the lines and stuff, this triangle is really important. I think if you cover up this triangle, or if this triangle was flesh and it's towards the center of the painting, it could it would flatten the whole thing. It would just be like a cardboard cutout of figures in a triangle. But this lets you know that there's ground underneath there and space. And our my eye at least jumps from here back to the tree, to the foliage. Yeah. And oh, that's really nice water. And this is also very modern cropping. They're like, she's coming into the picture plane. Someone really close up leads you in. She's looking at them. So that makes us look at the two of them 
there in a circle triangular formation here's another triangle she's leaning on this arm and somebody way in the back large to small okay i think i'll stop here now because it's a really good ending point and if you guys have any questions please feel free or if you want me to go back to a certain painting Katarina, thank you. That was so illuminating and exciting. Just great, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you folks for joining us. Um, we can take a couple of questions. We have just a couple minutes. Um, you can feel free to put questions in the chat or um, you can also unmute yourself and ask a question through voice. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you think, I mean, did they do this knowing about the geometry or did they do this just because they had a good eye and they just intuited the fact that you needed this to happen to make the composition work so well? I think I actually thought about that too, a lot. I think it's both. They learned composition from previous paintings and previous painters. And then once you absorb it enough, it comes out intuitively. Like it feels just right to place that shape there or another shape. I think for sure, of course, they learned it, but because it's so, it's so non-blatant because if you did it blatantly, it would sort of ruin the mystery of the thing and ruin the painting and it has to unfold itself as we see it. And even when I, I've talked about this quite a bit, but even as I did my presentation today, I saw new things in each painting and mm -hmm. I've been staring at, you know, I look at painting a lot. So I think it's a little bit of both. Thanks. Great, Ekaterina, uh, question. Is geometry defined with color instead of shape or most often with shape? Everything. It's shape, color, tone, and stroke. And narrative. Because the, the way Barnes hung his pictures, he not only hung them by color and shape, he hung them also narratively or like a juxtaposition. So there's a room in there which has um, the crucifixion and there's Adam's whatever skull in the gully. And then one of the metal things on the same wall is reminiscent of that theme. So he hung it by theme. I mean, and the same in the paintings. Great. Uh, another question just came in. I've heard that we need space to imagine our own images. So those which don't say all are most intriguing. Can you talk about that? Wait, can you clarify the question? I don't really... I guess it comes with a statement. Um, and the statement is, I've heard that we need space to imagine our own images. Yes. So which... So those which don't say all are most intriguing. Can you talk about that? And maybe, Dickie, you can unmute yourself if you want to clarify. Yeah. Oh, the clarification is leaving it for the viewer to finish with their own thoughts. So I guess maybe the question is like, how much do you leave up to the imagination? I think it's a question of how the timing of our gaze. Each painting has a di different point of revealing the structure and narrative. Like Bonard, for example, it reveals he reveals it to you slowly because all the figures are cramped to the edges and sometimes you have to stare for like a good 10 minutes to even um, see the figure. But in terms of leaving it to the viewer, I think the part of us deciphering the paintings is leaving it to the viewer. But in terms of physically making the painting composition and all the formal elements, they are really clearly spelled out because that's what makes it pleasing to our brains. We always want to know where we are in the space of the painting and what we're supposed to be looking at. So that's why a lot of landscape paintings, they always go on a road, like in on a diagonal and usually a road because I think psychologically our gaze follows the road and we're in. I hope that answers the question. 
Great. Um, did these artists subscribe to the rule of thirds? Uh, it doesn't appear so. So I guess- Of course, of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> the rule of thirds is if you split the picture plane, the picture plane is what, you know, whatever we're looking at, canvas size, paper, split it into thirds and all the information is placed on where those lines intersect horizontally and vertically and the lines themselves. I think the rule of thirds is a really good rule, but it's quite basic and simple and I think most of these painters would do that intuitively. Like Cezanne did it a lot of his, the mountain, Mount St. Victoria that he painted at least 50 times. On the first third vertically, there's a tree. The mountain is always on the third, you know, from the space above and yeah, it, they do. Okay. Are there famous paintings that don't totally follow these rules? I don't think so, because as I was not even, well, yeah, as I was walking around the Met looking for the painting that didn't follow the rules to prove my fantastic lecture false <laughs> that I attended by Ellen Feltes, um, I couldn't, I was like, there's a cow in a field. What could be here? Nothing. And then of course the cloud was there to match the exact shape of the cow. No, I think every single painting follows it to an extent, especially from the period and type of painting that we looked at today. Would you say that modernist abstraction or contemporary painting, conceptualist painting might not follow those rules? Well, yeah, if you're looking at a Roscoe, it, it operates on a completely different mentality, completely different mental space. I, th I think we're talking more about um, shapes that go together, discernible shapes in the human eye. Roscoe is about color and depth and making space with color. So re really there's no, not as much geometry there, but he did do the huge rectangles in relationship to the rectangle of the picture plane. Mm -hmm. um, why do humans need geometry in paintings? <laughs> because so we can look at them i think that uh it's mathematics and mathematics is an internal it's like a human need to organize space and organize time because painting even though it's flat it's time space color depth if you didn't have any structure to go on then it would be very hard to get the viewer to look at the picture for prolonged periods of time. Remember every single painter who's ever made a painting and has ever made it to a museum, all they want is for you to look at their painting and be like, look at me, I'm the best. Don't go on to Matisse, look at me. <laughs> it's a silent competition. Uh, all right. Uh, well, why don't we just take one last question for the night. Um, is the iconography of St. Peter upside down as on the cross in the composition drive the overall resolution of the composition? Is that with the horse? I'm not sure. Do you wanna clarify a read? I'm not sure which painting we're talking about since we looked at so many. Yes. Well, no clarification has come in. Um, I'm so, going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll try to get to that question another time. Um, thanks again, Ekaterina. That was really lovely. We do have a recording of this. It will be available on our uh, YouTube channel uh, soon. So uh, do check that out. And Katerina does teach uh, watercolor classes and painting classes at Fleischer. If you want to check her out uh, in her classes, do look on our website. Um, she's a phenomenal instructor. Thank you, Katerina. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, do come back uh, next week. We have uh, great programming coming up, including calligraphy, 
uh, and uh, other other really exciting programs. So I hope to see you all next week. And otherwise, stay safe. Have a great night. And again, uh, big thanks to Katerina. That was really, really wonderful. Thank you all so right. much. Bye. Thank you.